Hi everyone! Welcome to the Chapter 2 lecture for Crowley's An Introduction to Human Disease. This chapter is all about cells and tissues, the uh, basic makeup of our bodies as humans. So bodies are made up of various levels of organizational structure, right? So at the very basic level, we are made up of cells. All living things are made up of cells. Some living things are made up of only a single cell, like bacteria and some fungi and protozoa. But animals, humans, are made up, we are multicellular organisms. So we're made up of multiple cells and multiple different types of cells. So this is, in this example, I have a muscle cell, but we also have skin cells, liver cells, nerve cells. All these cells look different. They have different structures and they have different functions. Cells of the same type will group together to form a tissue. So tissues are groups of cells, similar functioning, like the same type of cells, maybe slight differences in the, in the different cells within the layer, um, that all work together. And tissues combine to form organs. So for example, the bladder is an organ that's made up of muscle tissue. The bladder has to contract when you urinate. That's the muscle. It's also made up of connective tissue and endothelial tissue lining the inside. So um, it's a combination of multiple different types of tissues and therefore multiple different types of cells that are all working together to form, perform a specific function, which is to hold urine and then expel urine. The, or, the bladder is part of an organ system called the urinary system, which is several organs that work together for a specific function. So in the case of the urinary system, the function is to rid the body of waste, of liquid soluble waste, right? So to create urine and then excrete it. So the kidneys do the job of making the urine, the urine goes down the ureters into the bladder where it's stored until you urinate. So these are all parts of the urinary system. They're physically connected together and they all work together to do a specific job of the body. So it's important to understand these different levels of organization because disease can arise at any level. So you could have physical traumatic injury to the bladder, such that happens maybe in childbirth, all right, that causes a disease of the urinary system um, or of the bladder. You could have disease at the tissue layer, so, or the cellular layer, like a tumor formation or some disease of the muscle, some genetic disease of the muscle that affects the bladder and therefore the urinary system. So understanding these different levels of organization is important for sometimes understanding where a disease is occurring, at what level in this organization a disease occurs. So cells in different tissues or in the same tissue, cells in the body have to, in a multicellular organism, cells need to be able to work together. And in order to do that, they need to be able to communicate. And cells communicate through chemical signals. They send chemical signals to each other. And there's sort of three different classes of chemical signaling that's based on really how far the signal is going. So juxtacrine signaling is the signaling between two adjacent cells, cells that are right next to each other. Um, this can be in a tissue, like in muscle tissue, where cells are tightly packed together, so they can, they're touching and can directly send messages to each other through chemicals and receptors. It can also happen in this example here um, in cells that are moving throughout the body but can come into contact with each other. So this example is white blood cells. B and T cells are white blood cells that when they come into physical contact with each other, they can signal each other and lead to activation of the cell. Paracrine signaling is a little bit further apart. These are cells that are close together but are separated by a space or a gap or some kind of matrix. Um, a classic example of this, of paracrine signaling is in the nervous system. Neurons communicate through chemicals called neurotransmitters and neurons are not quite touching each other, but there's a little a gap, a synapse between them. And so the axon of one neuron will secrete 
chemicals that are then received by the next neuron and that's how chemical signals neuronal signaling works so it it takes place over a gap um, endocrine signaling is how cells that are distant from each other in the body and completely different organ systems can communicate with each other and in this case one cell secretes a chemical that goes into the blood stream we call these chemicals that are um, endocrine signals we call them hormones hormones are basically any chemical that is uh, following endocrine signaling that's being secreted into the blood and then signals a tissue at a distant location any organ that produces hormones is part of the endocrine system and organs that produce hormones are known as glands we call them glands so a classic example of endocrine signaling is insulin insulin is made in the pancreas but it is secreted into the blood where it can go throughout the body and trigger cells in all tissues basically to uptake glucose so basically it just tells your cells to eat so when it comes to cells let's get a more up close look at their anatomy and their structure so cells are kind of like their own little microscopic countries all right they're these these uh isolated factories uh where they manufacture proteins and um lipids and carbohydrates even and they can export them out of the cell they can import things into the cell process them so they're very complex little mini structures um, all cells no matter what type of cell whether you're a bacteria or a human cell all cells by definition have a cell membrane or what's sometimes called the plasma membrane their synonymous terms and the membrane is always a phospholipid bilayer and um, its job is to kind of hold everything in but also to selectively let things in and out of the cell so phospholipid bilayers are what we call semi-permeable so certain things like gases like oxygen and carbon dioxide can freely move and diffuse in and out of the cell um, and water but other things like sugars and other like slightly larger chemicals um, have to be sort of let in either by a channel or actively through a pump and so it's the membrane's job to kind of be the bouncer if you will decide what is allowed in and out of the cell um, based on the needs of the cell and based on the environment so inside the cell the yellow uh, portion here is the cytoplasm which is the internal liquid jelly of the cell and it's sort of like the blood of the cell if you will the, our, your blood is um, a liquid where like all your nutrients and hormones are dissolved and that's how it gets around the body and signals all the different parts of the body and so the cytoplasm is just this liquid where nutrients are dissolved and can get to different parts of the cell um the center of the cell here is sort of the brain of the cell if you will the nucleus and i'm going to switch different slide to tell you a little bit more about the nucleus the next slide though is a blank table that's really meant for you to fill in and make sure that you are taking notes on the structure and function of these different organelles or little mini organs within the cell so let's talk about the nucleus so i zoomed in here the nucleus is this purple ball and there's a cross section cut out of it so you can see the inside so the nucleus is surrounded by a membrane all organelles within the cell have their own membrane that's just like the plasma membrane more or less it's a phospholipid bilayer the nuclear membrane is um, actually a double layered membrane and you can see here it has all these little holes in it these are pores that allow for a transport of rna into and out of the nucleus when it's made but inside the nucleus is where the genetic material the dna the deoxyribonucleic acid of the cell is stored 
So DNA contains all the information for how to build all the parts of the cell. And so we have to store it in a safe place so it doesn't get damaged because every time a cell um, replicates, when it copies itself, it births a daughter cell, uh, it has to make a copy of that DNA so that it can make an identical copy of itself. We don't want the DNA to get damaged. That's how mutations arise, damage to the DNA. DNA, I, if you were to take one of your cells and isolate the DNA from a single cell and lay it all out in a line, like a string, straighten it all out, it would be six feet long, okay? There is a lot of DNA in the cell. And so in order to keep it all fitting in that nucleus, it has to be really tightly packaged. And so um, DNA does have several sort of layers of organization so that it's not just a hot mess taking up too much space. It also has to be um, wound up, think of it as almost like a ball of yarn, right? So if you wind up a ball of yarn, then you can easily unspool it and access it when you need to knit or crochet. Um, but if you just kind of let it throw it all in a basket, it'll get all tangled and knotted, and then it'll take you hours to untangle. And so um, our DNA is constantly accessed by the cell in order to read instructions to make proteins um, and do gene expression. And so it has to be organized and, and packaged in a way that makes it both com compact, but also accessible without getting too tangled. So DNA, sort of raw, un um, coil DNA uh, is shaped in as a double helix here, which is the classic DNA you see in textbooks. But that double helix is first wrapped around these small proteins called histones. And then the histones all kind of coil together and wrap and coil into these fibers that then become super coiled, kind of like a telephone cord. That's like maybe dating myself, but you take you could do it with your hair too if you take a hair and or a string and you twist it a lot a lot a lot it'll just automatically kind of coil up on itself from all the tension and then that super coiled dna gets even more tightly coiled into these dense structures called chromosomes so our our dna is usually not packed this tightly into these x-shaped chromosomes or actually single a single chromosome, this is a doubled chromosome for a cell that's uh, dividing. So only when cells divide do they really coil up this tightly. Um, usually they're super coiled like this. So this type of super coiled, but also kind of loose, loosely coiled, we'll call it loosely coiled DNA in the nucleus is called chromatin and your DNA in your nucleus is usually in this form because that makes it more accessible for reading in order to make proteins. All right, so back to the cell overall. We talked about the nucleus. Um, the out, outside, directly outside the nucleus, you have these sort of pink membranes with the polka dots on them, all right? This is the next structure we're going to talk about. This is the endoplasmic reticulum. And the endoplasmic reticulum is actually a membrane extension of the outer membrane of the nucleus. So if you can see here, here's the nucleus. Here's some close up, closer up pictures of nuclear pores. All right, and you can see that the outer membrane of the nucleus actually kind of becomes this blue membrane here, which is that of the endoplasmic reticulum. So the endoplasmic reticulum, there's sort of two parts. We have this part here, which has these sort of flatter um, uh, structures that are chambers that have these little dots, these little orange dots on the outside of it. All right, so they're kind of bumpy. We call that the rough ER because it, it looks like it would be bumpy to touch. And then there are these uh, more narrow sort of chambers, tubular structures here, which are still membranes attached to this overall endoplasmic reticulum structure, but it doesn't have those bumps on it, all right? So this is called the smooth ER. The rough ER bumps are ribosomes, and you'll see ribosomes are here attached to the rough ER, but you'll also find them freely floating in the cytoplasm. 
So um, ribosomes are the site of protein synthesis. They are the machines in the cell that make proteins. So remember the instructions for proteins are in the DNA. And those instructions in the DNA get copied into a different type of nucleic acid called RNA within the nucleus. The RNA then leaves the nucleus and enters the endoplasmic reticulum, where the ribosomes that are plentiful in the endoplasmic reticulum read the RNA and make proteins. Right? RNA can also leave the nucleus and go into the cytoplasm, where it can be made into proteins as well. So the proteins are made here. The ER is sort of a protein-making factory, if you will. The rough ER, specifically. All right. The smooth ER is what the site of lipid synthesis. Lipids are fats. Fats and proteins are different types of molecules. Fats are not encoded by uh, genes, um, but they are made by enzymes that are encoded by genes. So the smooth ER is where lipid synthesis occurs. The rough ER is where protein synthesis occurs. So these proteins and lipids are made in the ER and then they are sent to the next structure in the cell, which is the Golgi body or the Golgi apparatus. Same thing, which looks like it's always described as a series of flattened pancakes. All right, the Golgi body is the shipping center or like the post office of the cell, if you will. So the ER makes these products, whether they're proteins from the rough ER or lipids from the smooth ER, they'll get sent to the Golgi apparatus where they'll get packaged in order to be shipped to the different parts of the cell where they go. If it's a membrane protein, the Golgi apparatus will ship it to the plasma membrane. If it's a nuclear protein, it'll get shipped back to the nucleus. If it goes to the mitochondria, so on and so forth. So this is where they get sort of packaged to be sent to the right location. The rough ER, I should say, also helps when uh, proteins, it helps fold the proteins correctly. When proteins are made, they are sort of made linearly and then they fold up into a three-dimensional structure that's very important for their function. The way this is related uh, on a cellular level to disease is that ER, when the, the endoplasmic reticulum is diseased or stressed, it can lead to misfolding of proteins. And ER stress at the cellular level is, um, uh, what's the word? It's indicated, it's uh, uh, implicated in a lot of neurological conditions, degenerative neurological conditions like Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease. That cellular aging leads to stress of the ER which leads to proteins not folding properly, and then those proteins cause your nerve cells not to function properly. So diseases sometimes happen at this cellular level. Let's go back to the cells. So we did the nucleus where the genetics are stored. And I guess from a disease point of view, that's genetic diseases are caused by mutations at the DNA level, and that could happen. You can have a genetic disease that affects the whole body, all the DNA and all of your cells, or specific cells can undergo DNA mutations that lead to uh, disease in that specific tissue, like cancer. So uh, proteins are coded in the nucleus. The information, the code is, is translated into RNA, or sorry, transcribed into RNA, which goes into the endo rough endoplasmic reticulum where proteins are made by the ribosomes. And the smooth ER makes lipids, and then those things get uh, sent in vesicles, little, little bubbles, membrane-bound bubbles, to the Golgi apparatus where they're packaged to be shipped to different parts of the cell. So that's sort of the factory part of the cell, if you will. Now, all of these processes require energy, right? So the cell needs energy in order to do these things, and the energy factories of the cell are the mitochondria. So let's switch to that slide, we'll talk a little bit about the mitochondria. So the mitochondria look like this. They also have two membranes. Their inner membrane is coiled in a funky way, um, and the outer membrane makes them look kind of like little kidney beans in the cell. Um, and their main purpose is to generate ATP. ATP is the chemical energy 
that is used, chemical form of energy that's used by the cell to fuel chemical reactions and processes that require energy. Um, so there's an outer membrane and an inner membrane to the mitochondria. Mitochondria actually have their own DNA. Mitochondria are thought to be ancient bacteria that our cells swallowed like long, long, long time ago. That one cell swallowed another cell and then the mitochondria kind of shriveled or the, that, the cell that was ingested kind of shriveled but stayed part of the cell and just kind of became the slave to the, to the engulfing cell in terms of it was tasked with making all the energy so that the, the cell, the engulfing cell could um, it basically evolve to do more and more complex functions. The mitochondria also has its own uh, sort of cytoplasm. We call it the matrix of the mito mitochondria, but it's kind of like its own little internal cytoplasm. Another organelle um, to mention are lysosomes that have their own specific function. Lysosomes are the uh, garbage disposals of the cell, if you will. They contain digestive enzymes, and so they are important for the process of phagocytosis, which is like literally cell eating. Cyto means cell, phago means to eat or swallow. So cells can pinch off areas of their surroundings and pinch off sort of nutrients that are in the air's surroundings. Some cells can actually even eat other cells, right? So like uh, phagocytes, like white blood cells. And when they do that, they take that material into the cell in forms of a membrane bound um, vacuole that we call a food vacuole. And the food vacuole then will fuse with the lysosome, which contains a bunch of digestive enzymes that will then digest, break down that food, that particle, that cell. And then it can be, those particles can be released into the cell to be used uh, in metabolism to build things. Lysosomes also play a role, an important role in a process called autophagy. Autophagy literally means self-eating. And this happens when, you know, parts of the cell become aged and decrepit and need to basically be recycled. So um, the cell, when parts of the cell, like if you have an old mitochondria in the cell that needs to be recycled, uh, it will, uh, the cell will form a vesicle around it and the lysosome will fuse with it and digest it into bits and the cell will build a new mitochondria, right? Both of these organelles can contribute to disease conditions. So lysosomes, there are a series of diseases called lysosomal storage diseases and they occur when lysosomes don't function properly and so you end up getting a buildup of of um, you know things in the cell uh, that need to be broken down and are not so basically waste products it's like if your if your trash pickup isn't coming right and you just fill up with waste all right so lysosomes are very important for uh, breaking down waste in the cell and waste fills up if this the lysosomes aren't functioning properly. And that can cause toxicity at the cellular level, which then causes toxicity at the tissue and organ and organ system level. Um, and those diseases are fatal without treatment. Mitochondria can also be the source of disease. So mitochondria produce energy. So if somebody has a mitochondrial disease, it, their cells are not able to produce enough energy. So if if that's throughout their body, then that can lead to conditions that include poor growth, developmental delays, muscle weakness. And um, if it is in certain tissues, it can lead to you know, specific diseases of that organ system. Um, mitochondrial diseases are also fatal without treatment and can affect um, single organs or multiple organs. Another thing I'll say about mitochondria is that they're found in all cells, but different cells have different numbers of mitochondria. So there's not just, there's only one nucleus in a cell, but there's multiple mitochondria in a cell. In this example cell, there's only two, but most cells have like dozens or 
hundreds of mitochondria in them to make lots and lots of energy. The more energy a cell needs, the more mitochondria they have. So, so muscle cells and, and brain cells have way more mitochondria than something like a skin cell, which mostly just sits there. Um, so we've talked about mitochondria. We've talked about lysosomes and vacuoles, food vacuoles that form. Vacuoles are sort of just like transport vessel, uh, vessels in the cell. Um, we've talked about ribosomes. What am I missing? Ah, the cytoskeleton. So the cytoskeleton is within the cytoplasm. Let me go back here. So you can see these little uh, stripes or fibers, um, some of them here, 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 um, and these are uh, they're called the cytoskeleton because just like our skeleton gives us structural support and helps, you know, our body take shape. If we didn't have bones, we would just be like a bleb. Okay, so the shape of our bodies is determined by our skeleton. The shape of a cell is determined by its skeleton. And the skeleton of a cell is made up of different fibers. I love this picture. Uh, this is a stained, this, this is a cell that's stained with different fluorescent molecules that stick to different parts of the cell. The green um, are the microtubules, which are a type of filament that are particularly important in cell division. They do help give the cell shape and structural support um, and are very important when the cell is dividing and helping it pinch off and split and also to help the DNA divide into different sides. Um, intermediate filaments are not stained here, but they actually make up, they are very high tensile and they make up the main structural support and give the shell, it, the cell its shape. There's different types of intermediate filaments depending on the tissue type, the cell type. So for example, epithelial cells like in your skin um, use keratin the main intermediate fil filament in them is keratin. In muscle cells, the main intermediate filament is called vimentin. In neuronal cells, the main uh, filament, intermediate filament is, are these neurofilaments and so on. In red, in this image, the red is the microfilaments. And microfilaments are made mostly of actin and um, they are very plentiful in contractile cells they can grow and shrink and, and help to um, help cells to move, um, help cells to change their shape, and, and are particularly important in the contractile functions of muscle tissues. So that is all the different parts of the cell. So make sure you fill in these notes and know your cell parts. Um, oh, I didn't talk about centrioles. Um, quickly mention these. These are the centrioles here. They are um, made of microtubules and they are important in cell division. They help to split the DNA uh, when a cell divides. Um, they form the mitotic spindle, if you will. All right, so cells make up tissues. And there are four different main types of tissues in the body. We have epithelial tissue, connective tissue, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. Epithelial tissues make up the lining of both the outside of the body, so your skin is just one giant epithelial tissue, but also the inner linings of organs in your body, like the GI tract, the urinary tract, are lined with epithelial tissue. So epithelial tissues are characterized by a bunch of cells squished together. And they are either in one layer, we call those simple epithelial tissues, or in several stacked layers, we call those stratified epithelial tissues. The shapes of the cells are also part of the distinction of epithelial tissue. So they can be squamous, meaning they're sort of flat cells. If they're flat and stacked, then we say they're stratified squamous. Got it? There's The cells can be cuboidal, so cubed in shape, or they can be columnar, so tall column shapes. 
So a simple columnar epithelium would be one that's made up of a single layer of column-like cells, and a stratified squamous epithelium is one that's made up of several layers of flat squished cells. You'll notice in all types of epithelium, there is this basement layer, right? This basement membrane that these cells are attached to. And that's important for the integrity of the membrane. Um, so epithelial tissue, again, it it's, has a function of protection. It's sort of the outer layer of uh, lining of tissues. Um, it's also important and plays a role in secretion. Usually these are the columnar um, epithelial tissue that have secretory cells and secrete things. Um, so they're important in all of our glands. So hormones uh, are secreted by epithelial tissues. So we've already talked about endocrine uh, glands. Endocrine glands make hormones that are secreted into the bloodstream and then are transmitted to different parts of the body. Exocrine glands are ones that secrete things to the outer parts of the body. So sweat glands are exocrine glands. Mucus production in the respiratory tract, your nose and deeper in the respiratory tract and in your gut. So any kind of mucus secretion, that is a, an exocrine form of secretion. And all of these are gonna be done by epithelial tissues. So that's the function of epithelial tissue. Connective tissues do what they say they do. They connect things. So these are largely found, a lot of these you'll notice are part of the skeletal, musculoskeletal system. So there's um, dense connective tissue that is in the, the muscular system, our tendons. Um, all of the tendons and ligaments um, are made up of fibrous connective tissue cartilage, which is sort of like a tendon, but it's like a between your bones. Okay, so ligaments and tendons connect, or tendons connect muscle to bone, ligament connects bone to bone, and cartilage forms these sort of soft, pa squishy pads between bones, and in some cases in place of bones, like in your nose, where it's all flexible tissue there. Um, your bones themselves are made up of connective tissue, a, a more dense and rigid type. And then um, under your skin, the subcutaneous tissue right under the skin is also a form of connective tissue that's just full of fibers. And uh, your adipose tissue, so a lot of our padding layers, if you will, the subcutaneous and adipose tissues are connective tissue. And the blood is actual connective tissue, which may seem a little out of left field, but your blood actually comes from your bone marrow. So that makes sense. So that's why these, all of these, the connective tissues arise from the mesoderm during uh, embryonic development. So they all, what they have in common is they all sort of arise from the same embryonic progenitor cells. Um, these different connective tissues are made up of different types of fibers. They're very fibrous tissues. So um, some are made up of collagen, some contain elastin, and some contain reticulum. And this, so those different fibers have different tensile strengths, if you will, that then give these different connective tissues their different strengths. Um, the cells in connective tissues are not directly next to each other, pushed up next to each other, like in epithelial tissues. They are separated by what's called a matrix. So it's the matrix that's really full of all these different fibers. So it's a few cells scattered within these matrices. Um, or sometimes called the extracellular matrix. Another thing about connective tissues is um, the blood vessels that, so the lining of your blood vessels, it is a lining and it's kind of like, it is kind of an epithelial tissue, the endothelium, it's called the endothelium of the blood vessels but it's technically a connective tissue because it arises from the mesoderm. So 
it's kind of an in-between type of tissue. Um, so that is connective tissue. Connective tissue is largely protective. I guess it provides structure, and rigidity, and padding, if you will, except for the blood, which is kind of an outlier and has a lot of different functions. Muscle tissue is contractile. So it has these um, proteins, actin and myosin, that form these contractile units called sarcomeres that when the muscle is relaxed, they're like this, and when the muscle contracts, they go like this. And so um, that is the purpose of muscle tissue contraction. There's three different distinct types of muscle tissue. We have our skeletal muscle, which is what we generally think of with muscle tissue, so your biceps when you flex, all right? These are voluntary muscles. They move when we want them to move, when we tell them to move. Um, and they are characterized on a cellular level by these distinct striations or banding patterns on the cells. Cardiac muscle, um, and actually I'm gonna do smooth muscle next. So then the opposite, I guess, of our skeletal muscles, because they have no striations at all, are the smooth muscles. And these are involuntary muscles. These are muscles that line our organs. So we talked about the bladder as being a muscular organ earlier. Um, the bladder contraction is involuntary. That happens naturally. Your intestines are constantly contracting to move food along the digest digestive tract. All right, that is involuntary. We do not consciously control the contraction of our, our GI muscles. Um, and then somewhere in between these two tissue types uh, is cardiac muscle. So cardiac muscle, like smooth muscle, is involuntary. It contracts um, based on uh, nerve signaling from the brain that's not controlled by our will. Um, and it does have some light striations, some light banding patterns, but it's different and stru structurally different at the cellular level than skeletal muscle. So these are the three different types of muscle and cardiac muscle is only found in the heart specifically. And then the fourth type of tissue is the nervous tissue. So these are in our brain and spinal cord and peripheral nerves, and these help control our muscles. They transmit nerve impulses, so the neurons are the ones that are responsible for transmitting those nerve impulses, sending uh, uh, motor uh, information to our muscles, and also sending sensory information back to our brain, sensory information from our eyes, from our sense of touch, sense of smell, taste, so on. Um, so the neurons are these funky looking yellow cells in yellow, so they have a cell body and they have many branches called dendrites, and they have a long tail called an axon, which ends in a synapse or multiple synapses that connect with other neurons, and that's how signals transmit. Um, the, there are also, uh, part of the nervous tissue is these other cells, the support cells of the nervous system, which are collectively known as the glial cells, or the neuroglia, and there's a lot of different types of neuroglia, and some of them are pictured here. I like this picture because it kind of shows them actually connected to um, the neurons themselves. So we have things like oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells, which actually produce myelin sheaths that coat the axon of the nerves so that they can transmit signals faster, just like wires have a plastic non-conductive coating on them. It also helps to protect the axon because it's long and skinny, so very fragile and vulnerable. We have astrocytes, we have microglia. Microglia may, are basically like the macrophages, they're like the white blood cells of the nervous system, so they can protect from pathogens and help degrade. Uh, dying neurons. The ependymal cells line the ventricles and cavities in the brain and they produce cerebrospinal fluid which helps to nourish um, the nerve cells. So these are all the support, these are various types of support cells um, that are specific to the nervous system. So those are the different cell and tissue types. Now in order for cells to 
uh, get nutrients from their environment or send signals out to other cells, they need to be able to transport things in and out of cell. So there's two major types of cell transport. There's passive transport and active transport. Passive transport involves things moving down a concentration gradient. So here, there's a lot more concentration of these particles, right? Whatever these particles are, water, salt, whatever, sugar, okay? Um, to an area of lower concentration. So passive transport occurs down, we say it goes down the concentration gradient from an area of, of high concentration to an area of low concentration. That's the definition of diffusion. Active transport goes in the opposite direction. It goes against the flow, if you will. So it goes from the area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. We sometimes say it goes up the concentration gradient, like it's going up river, upstream. You're going against the current, um, the natural sort of current or flow. If you're, if you're a, a paddler, um, it's really easy to go downstream and go with the current, go with the flow, right? But it's a lot more difficult. It takes a lot more energy to go against the flow. And that's why it's called active transport because it requires energy. It requires ATP. Passive transport does not. If you're going downstream in your boat, you can sit there and hold your paddle and relax and take a nap and you'll still go down the stream. Uh, it doesn't take any energy. So we call it passive transport. So a really important type of passive transport or a important type of diffusion is specifically uh, called osmosis, and that is the diffusion of water. And this is very critical in cellular environments. So I've just discovered my little use of the pen here. I'm going to make more use of it. Um, you can have really a cell can be in one of three different situations. So ideally, it's in an environment that is isotonic. So tonicity refers to the concentration of solutes, like salts or sugars, in a aqueous, watery environment, all right? Ideally, a cell has the same, um, the, the concentration within the cell is the same as the concentration outside the cell. Oh, sorry, this is the inside the cell, outside the cell, but they're the same, and when that happens, water will flow freely through the membrane in equal sort of equal directions so water will go into the cell and out of the cell at the same rate and so you have this balance of water flow and that is the ideal situation for any cell right if the concentration of solute outside the cell so the salt or sugar or whatever dissolved in the environment is very high it's higher than it is inside the cell that is a hypertonic situation. And in that case, water is gonna flow from the cell out of the cell because there's more water, it's more watery in the cell than outside the cell. So water will flow in this direction. It kind of sounds a little bit like it's not diffusion because it's flowing from an area of low solute concentration to an area of high solute concentration. Um, but that's because this is an area of high water to low water. So it is diffusion of water. A good way to remember it is that water follows solute. So wherever there's a higher concentration of solute, that's where water will flow. So if there's a higher concentration of solute outside the cell, water will leave the cell to go into the environment, which will leave the cell all shriveled up. And for red blood cells, we say that they are crenated, crenated, it's crenation, crenate. It's another word for cell shriveling. Um, and this is not ideal for, for cells. It's, it, the cell becomes dehydrated and the chemical reactions won't, won't work properly. And this can be devastating for a cell, but it can be reversible. A hypotonic situation in some ways is more dangerous because in a hypotonic situation, the uh, concentration of solute inside the cell is very high and so water flows into the cell to try to sort of dilute it right and when water flows into a cell it swells and it can rupture when cells rupture we say they are lysed if it's a red blood cell lysing we call it hemolysis hemo means blood 
lysis means rupture. And hemolysis, rupture of your red blood cells, can be very dangerous because red blood cells are necessary to transport oxygen to all the different parts of your body, and oxygen is necessary for your cells to respire. And so if you can't, it's basically you're suffocating yourself if you have hemolysis. Your cells aren't, aren't able to get the oxygen they need. So this is important um, from a organismal level. You need to have uh, the right balance of solutes and water in your blood um, in order to keep your red blood cells happy. You need it in your tissues in order to keep your tissue cells happy. And this type of situation can happen if you drink too much water or have too much salt. It also can happen if there's a failure of the pumps, the active transport that is uh, um, pumping things, solutes into and out of cells. If these are broken, then you can get a buildup of solutes on one side of the cell or the other that causes hypertonic or hypotonic situations. Um, some other things about cells, they can change over time in response to other environmental stressors. Things like, so some terms to know, atrophy, we usually think of it in the terms of muscle, but any cells can become atrophy. So atrophy is a reduction in both the size and number of cells in a tissue. So we typically think of muscle atrophy, particularly in muscles that are not being used and they shrink or die, some of the cells die off. Um, hypertrophy is the opposite, hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Hyper means excessive. All right, so hypertrophy is an increase in the size of the cells themselves, and hyperplasia is an increase in the number of cells. So you can have both, or you can have one. Um, hypertrophy in heart cells, so this is a normal heart cross-sectioned, and this is a hypertrophied heart. You can see it's much thicker. This muscle layer is much thicker. At the cellular tissue layer, you can see there's a lot of spaces. The muscle cells are very narrow with a lot of space between them, and here the muscle cells are fatter and all squished together. And that shows at the cellular tissue layer and also at the organ, as, at the organ layer um, or organ level. Metaplasia, dysplasia, and neoplasia are sort of different uh, abnormalities along a spectrum. So metaplasia is a change in the tissue structure, in the cell structure, um, and that often occurs when a cell is, cells or tissues are exposed to a certain type of environment. It's often, so for example, smokers, um, the tissue in their lungs, will uh, the epithelial tissue will change in response to the smoke that they are regularly exposed to. That metaplasia can then progress to dysplasia where the cells become sort of very abnormal um, and even lead to neoplasia which is uh, tumor formation. Um, the total disruption of the normal epithelial layer. So here is shown this is a cervical dysplasia. So this is actually a section of cervix where over here on the left side, it's normal. So you see this normal stratified squamous epithelium. And then as you move across the layer though, you start seeing the degradation or change of the cell structure. It's no longer looking like a normal squamous epithelium. And then by the end, it kind of um, completely is a different uh, structure. And so these are kind of difficult for novice eyes, even my own, to distinguish histologically, but pathologists are trained to notice and recognize these subtle changes in cell structure and cell layers. Um, to be able to identify an early detect, detect uh, dysplasia before it becomes neoplasia, before it becomes potential cancer. When cells um, are injured, they die, but also sometimes when they're not injured, they die. So there's two different types of cell death um, that are important to distinguish. So cell injury, when a cell is damaged, 
okay? Sometimes the injury is reversible and it can recover from that injury, but when it is injured, it'll start having certain characteristics. Again, that trained pathologist can see um, under a microscope. So things like cell blebbing, so the membrane is usually normally pretty smooth, um, but it'll start to bleb. <laughs> that is the actual term, scientific term for it. It'll form these little sort of bubbles. Um, and the DNA will start to separate and degrade. Uh, some of the membranes um, might start to fall apart on the organelles. All right, and that ultimately leads to complete degradation of membranes and the cell just kind of disintegrating into pieces. And that is an inflant, that, that process leads to inflammation and white blood cells will come and secrete inflammatory enzymes and molecules and basically, you know, gets the immune system involved. It results in inflammation. So necrosis, this process of cell death from injury is called necrosis and it is inflammatory. But there's also a way for cells to degrade when their lifetime is up and um, it is just time for the body to remove them from existence. And that is a very programmed and structured form of cell death that is called apoptosis. And it's organized. And so in, in um, tissue injury, the cells actually swell and they form these blebs on these swollen cells. But in apoptosis, the cells shrink and form these little membrane, these blebs that break off in membrane bound little pieces that can then be eaten by phagocytes. So the cell doesn't disintegrate and fall apart and spill out everywhere. It breaks up into little pieces um, that are membrane bound. And then those pieces are swallowed up by phagocytes and there is no inflammation in this case. So necrosis you generally happens when cells are injured, when they are sick, diseased, or there's physical trauma. And apoptosis happens when the cell is just ready, the tissue is ready for the cell to go bye-bye because it is old and, um, or it is not needed anymore. For example, um, in embryonic development, when tissues are developing, new cells are being made and old cells get kind of eaten away as they're not needed anymore. Um, so these are two distinct processes that have very different outcomes on the organismal level because one is inflammatory and one is not. Lastly, cells do get old and um, they die when they get old, but also they stop uh, procreating, right? So just like as people age, our reproductive systems start to fail and we can no longer reproduce, cells have a limited number of divisions. So um, a single cell, you start a cell, cell can divide, undergoes mitosis and it splits and it divides. Every time the cell divides though, um, the DNA, at the end of the DNA, there are these little protective caps called telomeres. And every time the cell divides the telomeres, which are basically just extra DNA that kind of protects the ends of your DNA. So the orange parts here are like, that's actually what codes your genes. The telomeres are like sort of these protective end caps. And every time a cell divides that end cap, that telomere gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And then ultimately there's no more telomeres left. And then what happens is the DNA starts to be affected and um, the DNA starts to get shorter and shorter and that will kill a cell because and then you're starting to disrupt the actual code, the programming code of the cell, and it won't be functional anymore. So every time a cell divides, the telomere gets shorter. So this was a phenomenon that was noticed by a, a Dr. Hayflick. Um, when he was growing cells in culture, he noticed that the cells would divide and they would grow and divide and divide and multiply and keep growing for months and months and months, but eventually they sort of stopped being able to divide and they started to die off. That cells had a lifespan 
they had a specific number, a designated number of divisions that they can undergo before they died. And different cell types had different numbers of divisions they could go through. And this, this was known as the, the Hayflick limit. And the Hayflick limit was later experimentally determined to be due to telomere shortening. So it was, it was explained by this process of telomere shortening. So we know that cells age, that they age when they divide, that they have a fixed number of divisions they can go through because of the length of their telomeres. That's why our organ, our tissues degrade as we age. That's why we go through all of the um, process of aging because our telomeres in our cells are shortening with each division. So a lot of anti-aging research is uh, around how can we prevent our telomeres from shortening? How can we make cells last longer and therefore our organs and tissues and bodies last longer? There are certain types of tissues where the telomeres do not shorten. They have an enzyme called telomerase that repairs the telomeres and keeps them in place and those types of cells are what we call immortal they can divide indefinitely forever they just keep dividing and dividing and dividing and they don't ever have shortened telomeres these are the case of stem cells um, our stem cells have telomerase and also a lot of cancer cells reactivate telomerase enzyme in order to keep dividing indefinitely and so um, some of the studies into cancer research are actually anti-aging studies. How can we um, get telomere, telomerase turned on in cells that maybe we want to continue to divide, but also without inducing cancer? So there's sort of a downside to immortality uh, at the cellular level. And that is the end of chapter two.